Good evening, and or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, good to see you online again here. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can uh, communicate through, for example, a chat menu, or um, even if you have a microphone, you can use that, of course, too. The idea, of course, is that this is a session for all of you that are studying, learning, trying to cover some of this material. And so if you have any questions, certainly we're here to answer them. And what I will do, uh, as well as touch on some of the key areas, certainly, that we need to be familiar with, we're going to, in the first hour today, look specifically at the Certified Security Sentinel uh, certification. And that certification looks at a lot of the, should we say, fundamental and foundational areas that we need to be familiar with from having a good, should we say, basis of understanding of what certainly security is. We introduced some of these topics then last week, but or in the last session, I should say. But what we want to add to it now as well is we want to then look in a little, little bit more detail of these uh, chapters 4 through 10, or modules 4 through 10, of then the CSS. We know that the internet has very much changed the world. From even in my generation, where of course I grew up in a time of typewriters, to certainly what it has done as far as the sharing of information, the bringing of people together, the availability of support services, and really at work, the internet has opened up tremendous capabilities. We of course just passed, you know, uh, the Black Friday and uh, Cyber Monday sales. And the ability for us now to order products easily from <laughs> around the world, to be able to, in many cases, move away from the traditional what we call bricks and mortar type of operations to online uh, e-commerce and so on of today. It also, of course, has allowed us, as far as work goes, to be able to get our products and our message out to a much wider population than we ever could before. Now a store that's in, you know, uh, Plano, Texas, can easily, of course, be uh, marketing to people globally. But certainly throughout its, you know, expanding its primary market area. People don't have to make a personal appearance anymore. So we, you know, are allowed to set up things like websites, which will, well, for one, promote our products and services, but also enable people to get assistance, enable people to get education, uh, accessing uh, user manuals for products, advice. And so in many cases, of course, the internet has become an essential part of our work environment as well. And <clears throat> the the thing is, like any other technology, or should we say almost anything, it has both pros and cons. When we see, for example, the internet used in a workspace, it of course has enabled a lot of, should we say, uh, the ability to <clears throat> be much more efficient, be, you know, get access to things we couldn't before. But at the same time, it's also opened up new areas of vulnerabilities and new areas related to criminal behavior, for example, <clears throat> and other types of activities that are just not appropriate in a workplace. A person may expend a tremendous amount of time when they should be productive just surfing, if you will. And so most organizations have set out acceptable use policies. And these acceptable use policies, <clears throat> it depends a lot on the organization as to the structure of them. Some acceptable use policies are very permissive and say, hey, go pretty much anywhere, just don't do anything illegal. 
whereas others are very restrictive and sort of like we used to see in the old days too with the telephone. A lot of companies had a policy that says the telephone on your desk is for business purposes and should not be used for personal use. So what is the approach our organization takes? And neither one is perfect. But one of the things that most organizations will do is we'll put, of course, in firewalls, we'll put in other types of tools that are able to, number one, restrict certain internet activities, but also enable us to monitor and to know if a person is doing something which is inappropriate. That allows us to at least advise them or take whatever action uh, is mandated for that. The one thing, of course, we have to remember when it comes to internet use is that if a person is using the internet improperly, that, of course, could expose our agency, our department, our organization to even some type of criminal charges as well. You even take things such as uh, using an internet access to maybe hack into somebody else. And if that hack comes from within my network, then that company can turn around and quite often hold us liable for that. We've had a number of cases this already where machines that, uh, in corporations that have been compromised have resulted in that company having to pay various fines and also uh, should we say, compensation to another company which has been then uh, compromised or attacked from that uh, uh, organization that had the compromised machine. There are a lot of websites out there that, of course, are used to distribute malware. And if malware gets into a company, it can do a tremendous amount of damage as well. We see even something like of the breaches we've seen in the last short while. They, in many cases, the way that people got in to an organization was through some type of internet-based attack. We see that this has led to the installation of Trojan horses. It's led to quite often the installation of then uh, malware that is able to, say, be keystroke loggers, to uh, capture screen images and so on. And the result of this, of course, has been the theft of confidential information, the compromise of people's privacy, or, of course, in many cases, huge amounts of financial fraud. So we need to have, certainly, an acceptable use policy that everybody in the organization should be aware of. Uh, having a policy that people don't read or are not familiar with is not going to make any difference. But if people know what is expected of them, what sorts of behaviors are permitted and which ones are restricted, that will enable us then to be able to enforce and in many cases help protect our systems from, in some cases, what people may actually do wrong. Most companies will have devices such as a firewall. And a firewall is a device that, well, the simple definition of it, of course, is a device that provides protection from one network to another. And there are the one thing, of course, we should, of course, immediately point out is the very term firewall can mean many different things. We have many different generations of firewalls. To use the term firewall is sort of like saying motor vehicle. Motor vehicle, of course, could be anything from a motorcycle to a snowmobile to a, a Jeep to, of course, a car to an SUV to a van to a transport truck. They are all the same under the same category of motor vehicle. We see the same thing with the term firewall. A firewall may be a simple packet filtering router. It may be a proxy. It, it may, of course, do stateful inspection. It can, of course, in many cases, do even deep packet inspection to look into the content of data that goes through the firewall. The firewall is a gateway device that 
manages then the traffic between networks. And it's important for us, certainly, to remember that, is that it allows us to monitor, regulate the traffic, but also, of course, it can watch traffic both incoming and outgoing, and a well-configured firewall may actually be configured with even products such as data loss prevention to try to make sure that confidential information isn't being distributed outside of the company as well. We know how it is, for example, in an office. Very often in an office you have a front lobby where the citizens, the customers can come in, there's a receptionist there, and that is sort of a, yeah, we could call it almost a semi-public area. We, we have very few restrictions on who can come into that area, and often we'll have additional security in that area where necessary as well. The idea of having a lobby like that allows, of course, us to have a point where we can connect with our customers, we can interact with our customers. But we don't want, necessarily, the customers going into the back office areas, the areas where we have people working, where we might have confidential information, and so on. And we do the same thing with the Internet. With the Internet, we have sort of a semi-public area we invite our customers into. And we normally call that, then, a DMZ. The DMZ is isolated off of the rest of our network. And in the DMZ, we don't keep anything that's really confidential. If we meet a customer in the front lobby of our building, and that customer is asked for certain information, we may bring that customer's private information out so we can sit down with them and uh, explain what, you know, what they've asked for and so on. But that customer themselves, uh, the only information available is that which that customer has asked for, and then when that customer is done, we take that information back inside. We do the same thing, of course, if a customer comes in and, should we say, has to make a payment. They'll very often make a payment, but that money is not kept out there in that public area. It's usually very quickly moved inside to a more secure area. And that's exactly how the Internet works as well. When we have a DMZ, we have, of course, an area where we can interact with our customers, provide information they ask for, maybe their bill, we can allow them to make a payment, but when that payment is made, then the payment details, say the credit card number and so on, is quickly moved inside so that you know another customer can't see the credit card or cash belonging to, say, the customer who we just worked with. It's important that we set up that partitioning, that isolation properly. Because what that allows us to do, of course, is have a safe way to interact and support our customers, but without having the customers able to gain access to information they should not be able to see. A customer should not be able to see the information belonging to another customer. A customer should not be able to steal credit cards or cash that has been deposited by another customer. And a lot of our needs when it comes to internet security come down to those points of proper configuration or we could say par proper architecture, just like we do proper architecture in a building and a physical sense. There are many threats out there on the internet. There's a lot of malware which is, of course, malicious or malfeasant software. And malware is intended to do harm. And there's many different types of that. There's the traditional virus, the worm, logic bombs, Trojan horses, remote access Trojans. And many of these are fairly sophisticated. Yet in many cases, the way they get into a network is through fairly simple mistakes that people make. People click on an email link, and this is why we tell people continuously, don't click on links. If, for example, 
somebody sends an email that says, you know, please update your account information and here's a quick easy link to do it, that link is almost for sure going to take them to a site that might look like their bank, but in actual fact is fraudulent. And people fall for these all the time. That's why there's so many of them. And we tell people repeatedly, don't click on links and emails. Don't open attachments and emails. Yet for sure they get a note from a friend and they open it thinking that it's a joke or a picture or whatever and don't realize that the moment they do that, they infect their system. And if that system happens to be a uh, system for, a, say, a government department, that can, of course, easily spread throughout that government department. <clears throat> In most cases, when we go out onto the internet, we use things like proxies to help protect us. But nothing will make up for, of course, the simple mistakes that people can make. And it's important for us, then, to continuously remind people that the internet is a dangerous place. And there are many ways and of course many people that would love to steal our money. And that is their job. So they're very good at what they do. And we have to be cautious therefore to make sure we don't become the next victim. We have to make sure that we keep our systems patched. We keep them of course um, uh, with the various tools installed to try to make sure that we will not have a problem then of someone being able to easily take over our system. A lot of this of course is that patches are necessary to fix the vulnerabilities that are found in systems. And yet, if we look at some of the major breaches, we had a very large breach back in May of the, or March of this year, which was related to the NBC website. NBC, unfortunately, had a vulnerability on their website, one that quite simply was, let's just put it this way, uh, inexcusable. The point of, uh, in their case, NBC having a, being subject to a type of attack we call cross-site scripting. There is no excuse for a company having a cross-site scripting attack today. We know what they are, we know how to prevent them. And so therefore, if a company has a cross-site scripting attack, quite simply that means they have been negligent in how they have then architected and managed their networks. And when this cross-site scripting attack was compounded of the fact that it allowed a script to be run on people's machines that could install a, a type of malware called Citadel on their machine. And Citadel is like Zeus. They're from the same family of attacks that is meant especially to attack then financial institutions. And approximately 80,000 people were infected as a result of that NBC.com attack. The problem with that was that the patches for that had been available for more than a year. So in other words, all of those people who were infected really were infected because they had not installed their patches for over a year. And that emphasizes the need to keep our patches up to date, to make sure that when, for example, next week, we know that Microsoft is going to release seven new patches next week and what we traditionally call Patch Tuesday. It's important then that as much as possible we deploy those patches because that is going to, well, one of them is related to a weakness with Internet Explorer. Another one is related to a weakness with Exchange Server. And if we don't deploy those, then we, of course, can become a victim of an attack based on those types of attacks. We have to, of course, practice, should we say, good practices and things like email. 
in many cases, the problem with email is that people, of course, click on links and uh, they get spam email and think that this is legitimate. The problem, of course, that a lot of the email that comes, quite simply, of course, is um, we can say here, it's a carrier for some type of an attack. It's important for us to remind people that email is like anything else we get from the U.S. Postal Service. It has to be looked at with a little bit of skepticism, and a lot of it is we get advertising, and we get other types of communication that we have learned just to ignore or th throw away. We see that people share far too much information in some of the chat services, whether or not they're using a product like Skype or WhatsApp or Facebook. And these social media type of platforms have often been used then in actually uh, sharing things like credit card numbers, personal information, that can easily then be captured by somebody else. So people have to recognize that anything which is done in a type of social media like that, for number one, it's, it's there forever. We post a picture, we post a little video, we post a comment. It's one of those things that just doesn't go away but it can easily be, we've seen this, in fact, it's been embarrassing for politicians, where a politician may have made a statement three, four, five years ago. And what does the media do? The media goes back through old Twitters. They go through back through old comments the person may be made in social media and brings that back and points out, we can say here, you know, something embarrassing that that politician had said years earlier. We have seen in the last week a major attack against Sony again. Uh, Sony had a series of major attacks back in 2011, but they've been obviously victimized again in a, in a very large and very significant and actually, uh, let's put it this way, it's a worrying manner. Uh, there's a, there is reason to believe that parts of Sony will not survive this because of the extent of the damage. And in this case, of course, we actually see in the case of um, Sony, one of the results of that is that they have stolen a number of the videos or movies that have not yet been released. And we saw as a result of that more than 1.2 million downloads of those pirated movies within the first couple of days. And we can sort of think, hey, that's neat, it's nice to get a copy of that movie, but that's actually a criminal act. And if I download something like that, which is pirated, I can put both myself, but also my agency at risk of some type of, we can say here, uh, legal type of action and possible fines. So when it comes to things like peer-to-peer -peer networks and sharing, we have to be really careful that if we're sharing any information, is it legal? Is this something that is, is appropriate, we can say? Now, one of the problems with a lot of this is that many of these attacks we've just talked about here um, will not be picked up by antivirus. To use something like Norton, McAfee, Kapersky, Trend Micro, ESET, all of these main antivirus products uh, is good, and we should use 7% of it will not be picked up by the antivirus. So the best defense against a lot of these attacks is just educating people of what these attacks are and what they should do about them. When it comes to, of course, accessing our company's network, we often, of course, connect through the corporate firewall. We, of course, then have, we can say here, a lot of things that make up the network today. We have what we call local area networks within one, one say, very often geographic area.
which allows us to easily communicate, share. We can share internet connections, share servers and files, and retrieve email. It's like, for example, our local area network is just like, of course, the hallways and so on that run between our cubicles that allow us to easily move around. And we need to, of course, make sure that we, if we bring something in from outside, is that allowed to be brought in and connected to our machine, for example, in the office? We get the problem here, of course, that people will bring in USB sticks. And we saw this with the very unfortunate case of uh, Corporal Manning, who turned around then and brought a USB stick onto his base, even though it was against policy, and was able then to download immense amounts of very sensitive information, that, of course, that he passed on to WikiLeaks, and does a lot of damage to his employer, does a lot of damage to his country through actions like that. So this is why we very often have policies about, you say, removable storage, uh, policies about something like wireless. Sometimes people think of, I'll bring in something from home. But there have been cases, of course, that people have brought in a device from home that has actually then introduced a virus and attack on then the corporate network. It's good, of course, to always run scans to make, our, make sure we do check to see if there's any type of malware on our systems, monitor the types of traffic we have on our systems just to see if there's anything suspicious as well. Many of you may be able to actually access your networks from home or from, should we say, even a hotel or some other location. And this remote access, of course, enables you to be much more productive, access the data, the applications that you need to. The fear always is that maybe an unauthorized person might try to use that same connection as well. So one of the things we have to be careful of, if we are given, for example, remote access passwords and even tokens, we have to be very careful to make sure that we are not using those, of course, uh, improperly. That we protect them. We don't share uh, our token or our password with anyone else. The problem, of course, if we share our token or we share our password and that other person maybe does something wrong, <laughs> I'm going to get the blame for it because it was my account used to do that which was wrong. We see, of course, in many cases where companies will turn around and they'll allow wireless access, and that can be great, but the risk, of course, with this is if I'm doing this from a Starbucks, I want to make sure that nobody else in that area is able to see what's on my screen. I want to make sure that my machine doesn't become compromised that could allow access to somebody else from that location as well. Some of the things you're allowed to do, of course, you're allowed to connect. In many cases, when we do that, we will actually then be able to set up something like a virtual private network. And the VPN will allow us to have, very often, a secure connection then so that someone else would not be able to if they were what we call sniffing the network. They would not be able to read the data we were actually transmitting. A risk always, of course, is that if I'm using something like wireless, it's very easy for anybody else to be able to listen in or capture that wireless traffic. So our requirement then is to make sure, of course, that we are encrypting our traffic so at least it can't easily be read by somebody else. <clears throat> One of the challenges we always face is that, for the most part, people want 
to be helpful and cooperative. And that can very often leave us vulnerable to attacks like social engineering. In the case of social engineering, is where a person has been manipulated to do something they shouldn't have done. When we talk, of course, about social engineering, there's a number of different methods used for this. One is intimidation. And intimidation is, you know, trying to scare, threaten uh, the person. I travel a lot. Uh, just as a point of interest, I'm actually talking to you right now from Sweden. And one of the things that we used to see quite often when people traveled was that they were told, if your bag is too heavy or if you have too many bags, when you show up at the airport, just, you know, make a bit of a scene and the, the person who's checking you in will probably just let you, it's okay, just don't do it again. They'll let you away with it we are able to intimidate that person to maybe you know, bend the rules a bit. And quite often we see this. Um, a person would show up at the counter and they would just make a bit of a scene and, uh, you know, but what have we seen in the last while? We see that many of the airlines have turned around and said, this isn't happening. If a person makes a scene, they're not flying. No one is going to intimidate or threaten our staff. And I think this is a very good thing that they have done. So that, you know, we have rules. And it's not the fault of the person that we're checking in with that our bag is too heavy. And it's not the fault of the person we're checking in with that they have that rule about bags. And so that person behind the counter has to know it's okay for them to say no. It's okay for them to say to a passenger, I'm sorry, you can't check that bag in the way it is. And you'll sometimes see that at airports today. People are quickly moving things around from bag to bag, opened up in the middle of the departures hall there with their, you know, clothing and so on strewn all over the place as they're trying to get their bags down to the correct weight. And these sorts of challenges, of course, have been necessary because of social engineering. Social engineering is where, of course, that person has been manipulated to do something against the rules. As we said, through, in some cases, intimidation. Another form of social engineering is appealing to someone who's sense to be helpful. Saying, hey, um, can you really just help me out here? I need this information and uh, I can't seem to get it. I need this access and I can't seem to get on. And the problem with that is that sometimes a help desk will be fooled into, say, resetting a password or granting access to a person who shouldn't have had it. Another form of social engineering is name dropping. You use the name of a, you know, a boss or uh, someone within the organization. And, of course, when you use that name, you say, oh, I was talking to so-and-so, and they said it was actually okay. Well, of course, the person we're talking to has no idea. So what actually happens in that case, unfortunately, is that now because I believe them, I may be granted access they shouldn't have had. And the fourth type of social engineering is, of course, technical. And technical social engineering is quite often the phishing attacks we see, the other types of, should we say, more technology-based, email-based types of attacks. And it's amazing how people fall for these. There's only one cure for social engineering, and that is awareness. Letting people know what social engineering is, so that if they're exposed to it, they would be able to resist it. And they would realize that, ooh, this is a bad thing, and I don't have to agree with it. So that, of course, is one of the most important things we do. It's almost like we inoculate our staff. We go to our staff and say that, hey, this is what social engineering is, and the problem, of course, with social engineering is that if somebody calls me up and says, hey, I need this information, 
and I provide it to them, who's going to be responsible? Unfortunately, it's the person who provided it, not the person who asked for it. And so there's no punishment for someone in many cases for trying to social en socially engineer our staff. And so that's one reason why we have to t tell our staff it's okay to say no. You, you know, uh, be careful. If somebody manipulates you to do something you shouldn't have done, unfortunately, it's usually the employee that ends up in trouble. And in fact, we've even seen this with sometimes even managers have intimidated an employee to do something against the rules and policies. So, and the only way to, of course, prevent this in most cases is we can say here, through some type of then uh, awareness. <laughs> a lot of, of course, the attacks that are done today are done, of course, uh, for financial reasons. We have a, a lot of money made through organized crime. They are, in many cases, actually fairly professional. And when we see, of course, being fairly professional, they, they learn how to manipulate people. They learn, in many cases, some of the ways to fool somebody. And what actually happens in many of these cases, of course, is that they steal people's money. We have, though, other types of attacks as well. We have attacks that are done for Eagle. One of the groups that's kind of famous for this, of course, is Anonymous. Anonymous, for the most part, they don't do damaging attacks. For the most part, they're just trying to attract publicity. They're trying to um, get attention to a certain cause. We often call them hacktivists for that reason. Now, the problem, of course, is that they become a little bit, should we say, just annoying. Uh, they're not our greatest threat. In many cases, we don't really worry too much about anonymous. Um, they tend to be very low-level hackers. Um, but when we see they do an attack, they quite often, of course, are just picking on something which is very vulnerable, very easy to do. And, of course, they're trying to, in many cases, just try to draw attention to something. They're very often ego-based or revenge-based. When we take a look at, of course, a lot of the um, approaches that are used by people in doing attacks is, of course, let me say here, it's based on trying to take advantage of people's, should we say, good nature. It's very often, of course, based on, should we say, understanding that, well, we saw this with the, the whole attacks, and I don't know if some of you saw the movie from Leonardo DiCaprio with uh, Abernathy. And, of course, he was an incredibly good con man. The one thing we have to remember is that he was also incredibly brilliant. He was very smart, as evidenced by the fact that he passed the Louisiana bar exam without actually ever going to law school. So as a person, he was very smart, and he learned how to manipulate people to be able to, in many cases, uh, do things that are just almost unbelievable you know, flying all over the world, getting a job as a doctor, uh, and all of these things that he did, of course, based is just on, of course, his ability to socially engineer and con people. So one of the things we need to do, of course, is make sure that we are resistant to those types of, should we say, uh, attacks and so on as well. We tell people over and over again that 
when a person sends, for example, a, a Facebook note or a email about some uh, poor starving person that wants to get, you know, a million likes or so on, or they, you know, want to get, in many cases, you say, uh, you know, a person's even won a lottery or wants help with some money and this sort of thing. Very often, these attacks are there to harvest information. They know that if people respond, what do they get? They get to understand email addresses. They, in many cases, can get a connection with a person that they can use later to manipulate that person as well. Now, there are many ways that we can learn about attacks and learn about a potential victim. Things such as, obviously here, if I want to break into a company or steal information from a company, sometimes the easiest way is just searching them on Google. The amount of information that's available. We had uh, a case with a, um, a casino, actually, that two of the people that were working on some of their IT systems were struggling, and so they belonged to a user group, a Java user group, and were posting large portions of that company's source code up in these user group forums to get help with then troubleshooting their code. Through doing a penetration test and a vulnerability assessment, that was discovered. And that, of course, was incredibly important because the last thing a casino wants is their source code to be available. And you know, that's also, too, that's in this case, we often use some of these products that are out there, Multigo and so on. Uh, there's a lot of really good tools that can help us learn about the um, uh, everything about uh, that's available on the internet about a potential victim. And of course, this is a mistake people make quite often as they they might belong to a group like that using their corporate ID, their corporate email address. Well, that's one reason why it's sometimes good to have a Gmail address. If you're going to do something like that, have Gmail so that, of course, it's not linked to your direct, should we say, company name and so on. The other thing, of course, is that we learn a lot of, about companies by looking at things like job postings. And a job posting, it'll often tell us, you know, what type of equipment a person has to have experience in. So we know then the language they use and, of course, some of their equipment. We, of course, um, will quite often uh, try to do things like eavesdropping. And eavesdropping, of course, can be done on wireless. Eavesdropping can be done on cable. But a lot of the eavesdropping can be done by sitting in the local restaurant and, you know, talking with somebody about their job, what they do, and overhearing what groups are saying, and so on as well. Going through the garbage of a company can often be a tremendous treasure chest of documents that have been thrown out. In fact, one of the mo more notorious social engineers was, of course, Kevin Mitnick. And Kevin Mitnick himself was technically incompetent. He, <coughs> excuse me, Kevin Mitnick had never really done anything technically smart. Um, all he did in many cases was use tools and techniques developed by other people. But he was great at social engineering. <coughs> and when he broke into Pac Bell, for example, then the way he learned how to break into the phone company was he went through the garbage and they had just done an upgrade and they threw out all of their old operating manuals. And so what's in the operating manual? All the commands and so on used to do various things on the telephone switches. As well as we'll often find when a company throws something like that out, uh, in those manuals could have been, for example, uh, usernames and passwords they used when they logged in, the phone numbers for remote access. And so all of this, in of course, had been thrown out and these sorts of things become available to somebody who's just going through the garbage. So these are sort of things we have to definitely watch for as well, where you've got a situation here where 
um, <clears throat> a person is able to pick up this type of information and of course and even phoning in when Kevin Bitnick got the source code for the Motorola uh, phone the way he got that was just phoning in and asked to talk to cellular engineering and <clears throat> They said, oh, the head of cellular engineering was on vacation. So they said, oh, um, so, and they said, would you like to talk to so-and-so? He said, oh, sure. And when that person, of course, answered, he says, hi, I was talking to, and he used the name of the head of that department, and uh, she said uh, that you could help me with this. I need a copy of the the latest source code. And the this person then turned around and emailed the source code for the phone to him at not a not at a business account but a simple uh, Colorado Supernet account and you can say it it wasn't that he needed any technical skill to break into Motorola he just needed a little bit of you know bravado telephone skill and in this case uh, name dropping as we say with social engineering so the more we can know about our target the more likely we're going to be successful in being able to of course break into them steal information and so on and the cure for all of this as we know is just quite simply awareness training telling people to be careful watch what they say in public areas watch of course what they throw out make sure that things are properly shredded <clears throat> we've had a couple of sad cases where a person of course has shared a USB stick or they've had an old computer from work that uh, should have been destroyed but instead they have given to their children and before you know it there's confidential information on there that became undeleted and available when we talk about, of course, deception and this whole area here, people, of course, become very adept at it. And, of course, we've seen a number of different cases, you know, fake job interviews, fake job offers. We've seen, of course, a person coming in. This is a, a case done against a company a little while ago. <clears throat> a person came in uh, pretending to be a technician or repairman. He says, hi, I'm here from the, your uh, company that looks after your photocopier and printer. And it's time for the annual just check up and make sure everything's fine according to our maintenance agreement. And the receptionist took this person back to the printer room. And the person had a little briefcase and opens up. They got some tools in there, you know, little brush, screwdriver and so on. So the receptionist says, well, I've got to get back to my desk. Uh, please just let me know when you're done. And this guy wasn't a technician at all. Well, he was a technician, but not a legal one. And uh, what he did was steal the hard drive off of that printer. Because on most of our printers today, especially the large multifunctional ones that are a printer, photocopier, scanner, and um, fax machine all at one, all in one, they have then a hard drive, and all the data that's going to be printed is put on that hard drive that doesn't get deleted just because it gets printed and so what happens in those cases actually is that they um, uh, what they actually do they steal the hard drive and it has on it in fact the, the winner of course in the W5 investigation was of course when they got a printer had just been returned from the Buffalo New York Police Department Narcotics Division and that hard drive on that printer had every document that had been scanned, faxed, and printed for the past two years was still on that hard drive. And uh, so these are the sorts of technical types of attacks that people use. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, so th pretending to be a delivery person coming around to the loading dock, that sort of thing, or of course pretending to be IT help desk on the phone. Uh, one of the things we often do, for example, <clears throat> when we do penetration tests into places like banks, you go into most banks, 
then they don't know who their IT staff is. They have, of course, many branches all over the place. And you show up in a branch and you have a fake ID card. Of course, I'm talking about legal penetration tests here. Um, and find that you say, you say, you know, hey, I'm here from IT. And you walk in with a coffee cup and a little briefcase and say, we just got to you know, check out and do a patch and upgrade on the servers. And uh, sure enough, they'll take you into the back room and leave you alone there in, in their server room. And of course, these types of social engineering are often very effective. People would rather trust people than not trust them. And uh, of course, what's the only cure for that? The only cure for something like that is tell them again. Repeat the message over and over again not to do these, you know, not to allow this and to follow proper procedures and so on with it. So we wanted today to give you a little overview of some of the things that are covered here in the Certified Security Sentinel. I've kind of gone through chapters 4 through 10 here. If you have any questions on these things, please let us know. We'll get back to you as quickly as we can. And um, of course, even today, if you have some questions, ask and I will gladly try and address those for you. <coughs> and um, the, the idea behind this is we want these sessions to be practical. You have ideas you can walk away with that are useful for you. And so if there's things like that that you have questions on, um, I am teaching all the time. And one thing that we find is that many people don't understand some of the technology. They don't understand the terminology. And so don't be afraid to ask because then I can, I can answer it. And I love doing that. So if you have any questions, please just say so. And uh, as always, we will try to address those for you. Welcome here to the second part of the session we'll look at today. When we've looked at vulnerability assessments, vulnerability assessments are an incredibly important part of being able to evaluate the security of our systems. If we are responsible, of course, for, say, in a physical security sense, if you're a security guard at, say, for example, a shopping mall, then we know that a big part of security, especially in the evening, is then after the mall closes, go around and make sure the doors are locked properly. People haven't left a back door open, and of course, people can get in through a loading area or other type of side entrance. And a big part of, we can say here, of being able to secure a facility is to know, number one, where we could potentially have vulnerabilities. And, of course, the second part is to know the techniques used by someone who might want to break in. So when we take a look at a vulnerability assessment, it is a very methodical, but creative way to assess our security. It should be thorough. To we, we know this. It doesn't matter if you've locked every single door in the building except one. Because the thieves will find that one. Now, having said that, you know, we've seen a number of attacks just lately. And attacks that have happened in the last, you know, few weeks and so on, many of these have been the result of vulnerabilities that have actually existed for years. It's just that nobody had looked for them. We have seen this, uh, for example, one of the places we've seen this, is then with the um, uh, open source attacks with Heartbleed back in April, 
that vulnerability had existed for a long time. But the problem is that nobody had really examined it and looked to see if it was secure or not. And when somebody did and found out that it wasn't secure, it was really a surprise in many ways. A lot of people assumed somebody else had looked at it. And that's always a weakness. I can never assume that somebody else is looking after my security. And so one of the things we need to do is we need to carefully evaluate whether or not my security is really working and not just count on somebody else doing it for us. We then saw that continue on with the shell shocker or bash related vulnerabilities that were found in August. These of course, again, that vulnerability had actually existed for two years. Just nobody had found it. And we've seen this, this with Poodle now and some of the others as well. So there's been a number of vulnerabilities found this year in open source. And this is, of course, one of the things that we'd said for years as well. Open source is better because you have thousands of people looking at it. And so therefore, if there's any vulnerability, well, it's going to be found by one of those thousands of people. But what we've actually seen in reality is that it wasn't thousands of people looking at it. It was thousands of people hoping that thousands of other people were looking at it. And so what we've seen in reality is that everybody assumed somebody else was reviewing their products and systems. If we then, in fact, going back to Heartbleed, Heartbleed, of course, was related to a little open SSL product. And in the case of Heartbleed, the people that actually wrote and maintained Heartbleed was three gentlemen, and their annual budget was $2,500. So that's one of the challenges. How much time do you think they put into it to look after something that only brought in $2,500 to be split three ways every year. So when we are looking at doing vulnerability assessments, our success is to find the problem. The success is not to be misled and think that everything is good when it isn't. But of course, if it is good, it's great to know that. At least we know. And when we've done a vulnerability assessment, of course a good VA should be a combination of both tools, but also in many cases manual processes. Uh, in some cases, of course, physical. When we're taking a look at a vulnerability assessment, we actually see one of my favorite reports that comes out every year is the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And it's a free report available that looks at what breaches did we have and sort of what were some of the things we learned from those. And if we went back to a year ago, the report actually said that 35% of all data breaches had a physical security component. So in other words, physical breaches play a very large role in IT breaches as well. And so when we are doing a vulnerability assessment, we have to think of physical. We have to think of people. And can I manipulate people to get information? We might have to examine a process to see is there a weakness in the process that could allow me access. Other things, of course, we can look at. We can look at things such as the um, scanning our various, you say, devices, firewalls. We can try to learn as much as we can about our target and see where there are potential vulnerabilities. Now, we do have, of course, a couple of really, really good tools. And 
you take, for example, if I'm going to look for vulnerabilities in, say, uh, an application, there's some very good commercial tools. I can buy these tools and, you know, everything from Fortify to um, uh, what was the old uh, Sanctum's AppScan as part of the IBM suite now. There's a lot of good tools I can use to help me examine to see if we have a vulnerability. There's, of course, a number of scanners that are available using Kali Linux, using, well, the old, what used to be, of course, Backtrack, uh, or using some of the Metasploit framework. There's a lot of free products available, you know, using Nessus and Nmap and so on as well. And, of course, products like, uh, you know, Saint and so on as well. Now, the one thing we should always do is we should look and examine things like OWASP, the National Vulnerability, Vulnerability Database. And that, of course, is available for free from NIST, NVD, uh, uh, National Vulnerability Database, uh, nvd.nist.gov. Um, and these sorts of, should we say, sources can help us to look and examine to see whether or not we have one of these, should we say, vulnerabilities that are already well known and well documented. If we take a look at OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, and we look at the top 10 vulnerabilities, five of those vulnerabilities in the most recent report were in the top six vulnerabilities of the last report. So in other words, over the three years between those reports, things didn't get better. These are still the most common problems we're finding. So our job is very much to use the resources we have and to see are we vulnerable to one of those types of attacks. Now, you take, for example, and this is one of the problems that it's going to be very interesting to see what happens, of course, well, with one, with Home Depot. We see the breach that certainly Target had at this time last year, a devastating breach that is going to cost literally in the billions of dollars. You know, the lawsuit of several of the banks against Target uh, has already been the first uh, motions have already been heard by the judge in St. Paul, um, Minnesota. And it's the banks that are going after Target for billions. And so there's going to be many more lawsuits back and forth between Target, Trustwave, and undoubtedly other vendors who are involved as well. <clears throat> and yet, in one way, the problem with this is that if we jump forward four months, Home Depot has the same problem. A slightly different tool, but really the same underlying vulnerability. And so the question has to come was, well, when Home Depot heard what had happened to Target, why didn't they check their network? Why didn't they examine to see if they had that problem? And this is the one thing we have to do, is we have to watch what's happened to other companies and quite simply make sure we don't have the same vulnerability, the same problem. And it happens, as we see, far too often. <clears throat> the one of the great things, of course, is that we have the ability to learn. And, but a person can only learn if they want to learn. We've seen a number of cases where companies executed vulnerability assessments. And when they executed that vulnerability assessment, <coughs> they found some problems. The problem, however, was that instead of addressing and fixing those problems, they instead ended up, should we say, just saying, ooh, that's a lot of work we have to do, and some of those are real, and some of those are just noise. And they never did anything about it. 
the the purpose of the vulnerability assessment was to drive, should we say, improvement. And yet we see in far too many cases, it didn't. All it did was, you know, should we say, okay, we've got some problems and nobody ever did anything then about them. So this is, of course, one of our challenges with this. We want to deliver a hard-hitting report that underlines to management the seriousness of some of, of course, the vulnerabilities we may have. So it also gives them a roadmap on how to fix them. Now, one thing we don't want is to, of course, as the result of a vulnerability assessment, kind of overwhelm them with too much information. We had a case of this. <clears throat> a person did an audit. And as a result of that audit, they came out with many, many recommendations. Well, the problem with that was that because they came out with so many recommendations, for the most part, the business looked at it and said, we don't even know where to start. We get tired just looking at this, and we're going to ignore it. And we see that very often. It would be better to come with, should we say, it often happens with government studies. We have an investigation into a serious problem. And so we have a maybe study that goes on for a year or more, gathering evidence and witnesses and so on. And at the end of this comes out a 2,000-page report that you know nobody is ever going to read. And it might have dozens and dozens of recommendations. So when this is given to the government and said, okay, here's the recommendations from that report, what do they do? They turn around and say, okay, we have to have commission, we have to commission another study to figure out how to implement all the recommendations of the past study. It's so big that they can't just say, oh, hey, there's a couple things we can do. No, they have to have another study to learn how to implement it. And I don't blame them. If I give somebody, you know, you know, 50 commands all at once, I can't expect them to know how to set them in priority and so on without having to sit down and study each of those commands and figure out which ones are important and which ones are just trivial. So these are some of the challenges we face with this. In the end, a vulnerability assessment should lead to improvement. So we can identify the things that are important. We can identify the things that are a quick fix. We can set out a roadmap that will allow us now to be able to certainly, uh, well, make progress. It's a lot like, I don't know if you're a Cowboys fan or a Texans fan, or maybe, you know, Longhorns, what's important? The nice thing in American football is that I know that if I can move the ball 10 yards, I get to keep possession. And the secret in many cases to the game is ball control. The, the more I keep possession, the less chance the opponents are going to have to score. And so if I can keep making incremental progress, maybe three or four yards here, another three or four yards there, as long as I can keep creeping up the field and moving the chains, as we often say, I keep control. But the moment I stall, the moment I lose the ability to build some progress, I have to give then the ball away. And the result of that, of course, is going to be that in many cases, of course, I'm going to be in a, <clears throat> a very difficult position. It's hard to score when somebody else has the ball. And so my challenge, of course, in security is to keep making progress. Maybe I have 20 things I need to do. 
but can I make sure that by the next, you know, 60 days I've got three of them done? Maybe it's going to take me two years to get to where I need to be, but can I at least make sure that if management turns around and says, so what have you done for me lately, we can show what's been accomplished in the last quarter, what's been done compared to the last reporting period. We're making incremental progress. And of course, the secret to making incremental progress is to know where you want to go. And a good vulnerability assessment tells us exactly that. It says, this is what we need to accomplish. And so now I can set out my priorities. I can set out my roadmap. I can set out my milestones to show where I've made progress until, of course, I reach then the goal. So as we see here, there's a number of little tools that come out here, the very good outputs and so on that uh, can help us to set out. You know, and for one thing we have to do is that a vulnerability assessment will often generate a lot of noise, a lot of things that are maybe not so important. And so the first thing I have to do is filter those out. Get focused on what's really important. And of course, that's the secret to this in so many ways. Are there any questions on that? Not so far? Okay. Let's take a look at the types. So, what occurs when somebody uses your personally identify, identifying information, like your name, social security number, or credit card number? That, of course, as we know, is a form of identity theft. And many people, of course, have been victims of this. Credit cards have been stolen. And, stolen. and in many cases, it's because companies did not protect the credit cards properly. We've seen this, of course, with the breaches of, uh, well, um, quite frankly, at TJ Maxx, uh, winners, the home sense stores. We've seen it with Sally Beauty, Marcus Neiman, and Target with their problems. And, you know, one of the problems, uh, as it appears with, with Target's Sally Beauty and Marcus Neiman, was that when they installed then the software for their point of sale terminals, it appears that they left the vendor supply defaults active on it, which the attackers were able then, of course, just to log in because it's not hard to find out what the, the administrator password is that's you know, used by the d vendor on all implementations. So that led, of course, in many cases to identity theft. So the FTC estimates that as many as 10 million Americans have their identity stolen every year. In fact, um, in a Federal Trade Commission, uh, I wouldn't say this. I would say that in most cases over the last years, that's, that number is very low. Um, we, we see a tremendous amount of identity theft. And it's actually interesting when you see some of the celebrities even that have been victims of identity theft, Bill Gates and Tiger Woods and so on. And that's, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, even for myself, uh, I subscribe to Stratfor, which is a strategic forecasting group out of Dallas there, which they do a lot of really good work, a lot of good reports on what's going on around the world. But one of the problems, of course, was that they had kept 90,000 credit cards up in their DMZ. And that's like keeping 90,000 credit cards in the front lobby of your office. And it's just too much of a temptation. If somebody sees all those credit cards sitting there and they realize they could easily pick them up and walk, them, walk out with them, there's a chance they're going to. Uh, in this case, the guy got caught and, you know, he got 11 years for it. But the problem was that still for 90,000 people, that meant they had to go get their cards reissued and so on because of that breach. And that was really completely the fault of uh, Stratford. They had not set up their configuration 
properly. And uh, so, and we saw, of course, just last year, 49 or uh, 70 million credit cards, of course, with Target. We have close to those numbers this year now with, of course, um, Home Depot. And so we can see here, 10 million is actually uh, very low in reality. We've had, of course, even with the, the group, uh, the breach at Chase Manhattan. In the case of Chase, it looks like the attackers had been on their system actually uh, for several years. And um, so it was not like a, a just one breach. So we'll go down and look at some answers here for Chapter 2. True or false? Social engineering is tricking normal people into giving out personal information related to, but not limited to identity, usernames, and passwords, and general information. And that's, of course, exactly what social engineering is. They ask here, of course, how often should we change your password? This is, there's a number of different guidelines that are used in this. The thing is that a, a password is a static value. In other words, it's a value that remains the same from one day to the next. And what that allows, of course, is that if a person learns somebody else's password, they can replay it. They can replay the login process. They're going to be able to, able to log in as that person until the passwords change. Now, the person never changes their password. Yeah, they have, you know, <laughs> unending access. So a lot of companies have sort of this rule, do it every 30 days, do it every 60 days. And that, for the average user, may be good enough. But if we're dealing with more secure systems, say admin-level passwords, quite often we'll have those changed maybe every two weeks because that's a more privileged account. And we want to make sure that if that was ever compromised, we limit the length of the compromise. The one, of course, secret to all of this, though, is to get rid of, should we say, a reliance on single-factor authentication. And that is, of course, a password is something we know. There are two other forms of authentication, biometrics and, of course, something you own. And good security these days is using at least two factors. Using, of course, maybe a password plus maybe a, well, in most of the U.S. federal government now, the use of a CAX card, the use of a physical card that you have to use to log into systems. And you would need that plus a password to log in. And that, of course, increases the strength. We see this being done by a number of banks now, and it's a very good thing. If you want to log into your bank to do online banking, you have to know your password, but you also then, you'll get an SMS to your phone. And that's a one-time password. And so when you go to log in, your phone will receive this message and you have to type that in as well when you log in. So you need both your password plus that SMS text value. And which of course means that for someone to break into somebody else's bank, they'd almost have to have access to their phone as well. Okay, true or false, every time you reboot your computer system, you want to check the processes launched before uh, to ensure that no one has set a process to start without your knowledge. Well, very few people do this. Ideally, we should, making sure that there's nothing on our machine that's going to boot up that is unauthorized. But this is sort of getting into the world of the remote access Trojans. And if a person has taken over a person's machine with some of the more sophisticated Trojans that are out there, they bury themselves very deeply in the registry and can be very difficult to actually detect. In fact, even if you take something like Zeus, Zeus does not affect the system overall. Zeus affects the browser, which allows the attacker to get access through the browser uh, 
And of course, most people are not going to check their browser configuration. That wouldn't do them any good if they did. Um, but watching what starts up on our machine is that's that's a good practice, and just to see what uh, sort of processes are there and so on. True or false, employees give employees access to the internet because it serves a business need, and we know that's true, right? In many cases, having access, of course, to the internet is, a, is an essential part of business today. It allows the sharing of information and so on, it allows, you know, e-commerce, all sorts of benefits, as we know. So what are some threats to internet access? Scripts, webmail, proxies, all of the above? Well, obviously, when we're talking about this, you know, all of these can be related to internet access challenges. We can have a scripts, of course, that can run on our machine that could maybe even have the login information in them. Uh, webmail, of course, that is a, a threat we can say here that, you know, is, are we using POP3? What is, what is the, how secure is it? And, of course, proxies. A proxy can, of course, block traffic. And if it's not configured properly, it might mean we have a denial of service as well. Okay, true or false? The organization should... Uh, uh, clearly state whether accessing web-based mail is acceptable in the internet uh, acceptable use policy. Well, this is not a bad idea, but the question in today's world if it's feasible, we're getting into of course more and more the use of smartphones and a person, you know, today uh, for many companies, they're encouraging the use of bring your own device or even CYOD, which of course is choose your own device. And the challenge with that, of course, is that we, we actually have less control over, in many cases, the applications and what's being run on those devices. And to be too technical or too specific in an acceptable use policy is often, should we say, um, not desirable either because technology moves on and changes. And sometimes changing the policy can be a little bit difficult as well. So, you know, something like this, if there's something we specifically are worried about, yes, we can put it into the policy. Um, but in many cases, we'll be a little more general uh, about, you know, practicing good internet behaviors and so on. True or false, a local area network consists of your company's email servers, printers, databases, network drives, workstations, and devices that connect everything together. It may. Uh, a LAN, local area network, very often is that all the things that support our systems, but in some cases even we will uh, use things like virtual LANs to provide segmentation of our network. Uh, defense in depth is an important thing, so we quite often, of course, will uh, create uh, networks and so on to try and provide some isolation between an area that maybe processes more sensitive information and so on. Um, and of course, most users cannot install what onto their workstations, software, hardware, applications, um, depending on the rights. Some people have admin rights on their machine. A lot of users don't. And if I don't have admin rights, that has a benefit. Sometimes that can prevent the installation of something like a Trojan horse or malware because it, the user doesn't have enough privilege to actually execute it. But the answer they're looking for, of course, is applications. Well, applications are a form of software. So in that case, answer A would also be, of course, correct. <clears throat> True or false, the system administrator uses specific tools to add or remove as well as uh, edits to the system registry tools. Well, we can. Um, 
in some cases it's very simple to update uh, system registry and so on uh, as well. But uh, there are a lot of admin tools that people have. The challenge with admin tools is that we should have strict controls over who's allowed to use them and to make sure that people are not running administrator level functions if they don't have that need for their job. And so, what drives uh, provide users with an accessible storage location that's centralized? Well, if it's of course centralized, it would be some type of network-based system. Uh, we often call it network attached storage. Uh, and that, of course, can provide uh, storage capabilities for, you know, many users and devices that are on that network. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the time for today. Hopefully you found some of this useful. Again, I encourage you, if you have questions, stuff that you want to cover, please let me know. And um, we'll look forward, of course, to seeing you in the next session as well.